I'm here today with Charlie Brumfield, the legend of racquetball, and uh, this is an unbelievable honor for me. Uh, I go back to the 1970s. I watched you from afar. I don't think people understand, and we're going to get into it today, what a rock star you really were and what a credit you really are to the game. So, anyways, welcome. Forward, and, Coach, I look forward to it. Let's have some fun. According to the Steve Keeley biography that just came out, and everybody's going to get a copy, I guess, at the U.S. Open, you hold like 22 national titles. Is that in racquetball or other sports or what? It's uh, separated into three categories. One, regular racquetball, national singles and doubles. Two, uh, outdoor racquetball singles and doubles. And three, paddleball national singles and doubles. And what I tried to do in my career is broaden the scope of my influence and build my credentials and curriculum vitae by branching out into the different related subjects and attempting to use the systems that I developed for racquetball and or paddleball amongst the three disciplines. Okay, so you've won 22 titles plus, not even counting all the extraneous tournaments and things, invitationals, challenges, and all of that. But there's more to it than just winning the tournaments. What am I, what does the record book not reflect? The record book doesn't reflect the style with <laughs> which I won those tournaments. And uh, early on I had uh, begun to represent myself as the hold this is before I had the titles I represented myself as the holder of all titles and the people's champion so what I tried to do is in the early stages particularly of racquetball was put on a really good show most of the time as the crowd villain in these tournaments and uh, it really assisted I felt in building the interest in the tournament the interest in the matches and spectators came beyond just the players and their families, which I thought was important to developing the sport to a point where it may be able to go on television and the players can make living off of it other than the top two or three. So there'd be a broad appeal of the sport and there would be more money flowing in from sponsors and from television and, and participation expense. So if I'm writing the script, do I cast you as the villain or the hero? I would say that for the majority of my career, I had a small group of accolades, <laughs> satanic in nature, <laughs> who were referred to as Brum's bums. They would be the alcoholics in the front <laughs> row next to the referee. And the remainder of the crowd was witnessing a spectacle that many felt was verging on the... Uh, the very edge of unsportsmanlike conduct. So it was more <laughs> like a wrestling match in many respects. So I would have to say villain. <laughs> so this year at the U.S. Open, uh, in this weekend at the Outdoor Hall of Fame, uh, you were honored. Why do you think the racquetball community's reinvigorated interest in your career, which has long been over, why the interest? I think part of it is because of a recent discovery of a treasure trove of old pictures. And um, in those days, I was in every story, pro or con. And those pictures obviously feature a lot of my escapades and wins and losses. And that's brought about some of the interest uh, another aspect is I have a health issue where I'm Elvis may be leaving the building soon and so everybody would like to pay their final respects to me in my career. Speaking of the final respects, let's go back, we'll get to it, let's go back though. I want to go back to the beginning. Not much is known about like family. Uh, I understand your father was a Marine. My father was a Marine uh, born in Mississippi. My mother was an educator, a chemistry teacher, uh, born in Louisiana. And uh, my dad obviously traveled extensively in his Marine career, and I went from, from place to place with him. I was born on Pendleton, 
which is a marine base uh -huh. in, in uh, the San Diego area, but spent most of my early years in, uh, in Virginia, Oklahoma, that type of, uh, of travel, and spent a big stint in Hammond, Louisiana. In fact, in many clinics, I would indicate that that's where racquetball started, was me hitting the ball against my garage with a, with a paddle out there. Uh, but seriously, I got back to San Diego, and it's been my home since uh, 1960. And it's where I started court sports. Uh, I started playing handball on the outdoor courts at uh, Mar Vista Junior High. So you started with handball? Started with handball. We never heard of paddleball or racquetball. And when we did learn about those sports, it was with a certain disdain. Handball players ha believed themselves to be uh, the meat eaters of the court industry. And at that point, I remember one exhibition I did with Dr. Bud Muehlheisen where we went to the Multnomah Club in Portland to put on an early exhibition of, of racquetball, and this would have been in the, maybe 1970. And they did not want us playing on the court. The handball players had a very strong political base, and they controlled the court systems, both uh, in the YMCA's and the Jewish community centers and in the fire stations. Wherever there were courts, right. the handball players controlled them. Right. So, leaving handball for a minute and going back even further in high school or in school did you play any other sports i was a remedial athlete they have certain classes for uh, athletes that are so rudimentary that they have to be separated from the common group <laughs> and i was either in those classes or i was the last picked on every sport, on every team. And I worked up a serious distaste for those people that I felt were dissing me. So when I got to where I could do something with the ball, in handball, racquetball, or paddleball, someone was going to pay, and they did. <laughs> so <laughs> it's here I have to fast forward. I read somewhere that you have a, a legendary capacity for explaining your mediocrity after you beat somebody. <laughs> and so people tend to take you lightly. And I've heard people say you're a far better athlete than what you give yourself credit for. Well, I, let's put it this way. I felt that I was the quickest player for five feet in the history of the sport. I think I was quicker than every single one of the modern pros. Now this is before I ruined my knee and back, which happened before I ever played a tournament. But what, what happens is that five foot is I've started faster than the slower thinkers. So whether you want to count that as part of athleticism or not, I was, I could beat the quick mercurial black athletes to the basketball on a loose ball because I reacted immediately. That's why my doubles play has been so excellent for 50 years is because I can play closer than other people my size. And again, high school. I'm staying on that for a little bit historically. Uh, what group would you be in? Like the, if you were in high school today, would you be with the punks, the jocks, the... Well, I was like a nerd because I was one of the smartest people in all of the schools I've ever attended academically, but I didn't feel like I belonged with that group and didn't get along that well with those people. So I, I really enjoyed when I got to be a locker room person where I got to start talking the talk and walking the walk in a sports context. And that's what I've done for most of my life. That's where I go to enjoy myself. And I get, and I always play sports where I know I'm gonna win. For instance, our match yesterday. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so your favorite subject would have been probably English? 
I was an excellent English person. I was training to become a lawyer. And my belief was there were two things, or actually three things, that you needed to become a lawyer. You needed to be able to read quickly and comprehend. You needed to be able to withstand a climate of antagonism. And you needed to be able to drink to entertain clients and to bring clients aboard. I practiced all three of those. And so it got me into a lot of personal troubles over the years, which I've had to mitigate and, and rectify. But the ability to survive and prosper in a climate of antagonism is what helped me develop the system I've used in all three of those disciplines in which I am now moving into the Hall of Fame because I would elevate the game to a point where I, the referee, the crowd, and my opponent were antagonistic. And that's where you're on the line on that sportsmanship. You're turning it into a circus for your right. own benefit. Right. Which I'm not necessarily proud of, but I do. Right. I do. I don't condone it in others. Yeah. Let's put a, it that way. As a side, as a side note to this, I went back to my college to speak to students, and they asked me, another lady and myself, and she's a track coach, about ethics, and and mm -hmm. coaching. And she answered it pretty much the way what you said. There's a fine line drawn between sportsmanship and the best coaches walk that line very, very carefully, almost sometimes going over the edge, but never quite in order to maintain their integrity. And that's pretty much what you're talking about, correct? The, when I first started playing, there was, we, we used the handball rule, the outdoor handball rule, which was once you struck the ball, if you remained absolutely stationary, it was not a hinder. So the, you would situate yourself so right. as to most inconvenience your opponent and then hit the ball by one of these spots. Well, when the paddle became available and the racket became available, that equalized that technique because you were about to get the waffle face if you tried that against an aggressive opponent. But what I did was I never cheated an opponent first. I would give them fair warning after they cheated me. If they cheated me, because we, we had inferior referees in the old days, there were no linesmen, there was just some guy out of the crowd that was stupid enough to referee, and the players had to have an honor among thieves. If my opponent breached that honor among thieves code, I gave them fair warning. If they refused to correct the call, I instituted the hit sign which meant that at every possible opportunity, I would hit them in a spot where they couldn't reach with their arms conveniently so that they would be going like this. Now, that was part of not having what you have in the modern game, which is everybody refusing to correct calls. No one corrects calls in the modern game and so there's a complete slowdown of the deal and the players begin to dislike themselves because Joe cheated Sam. In my day, it was settled on the court by the hit sign, by one or the other of the opponents, and then after a couple of hits, people began to play more honestly and it got to be a really fine yeah. match. Well. I don't know if I totally agree with that with the modern game, but we'll get into that a little bit later. You're, the first Nationals, you, you're a handball player, you become a paddleball player. Is that correct? Is that the right that order? And then you went to racquetball? Correct. I, I started playing um, paddleball in 1964. So I'd only played handball for perhaps three years on the outdoor courts. It only you played pretty young in 1964. Yes, I was uh, in 10th grade. Oh, wow. Now, keep in mind that at that point, there were no racquetball players in the sense that somebody would learn like Tiger Woods from when they were right. five years old and their dad put a racket in their hand and they started right. learning. We were all coming 
from other sports. Right. My two favorite sports were golf and basketball, uh, which I played with some success unless I was in one of these team situations because I looked uncoordinated was part of the reason why I was the last person picked. That also bothered me. Yeah. So um, what happened was I was playing handball doubles at the club at San Carlos in San Diego and we both swung at the same ball and I dislocated my finger and couldn't play handball and I saw some wussies playing with a paddle and I figured well I'll be able to play that sooner than I can handball and I started playing paddle ball and we had a little uh, in-house tournament which you know I'm playing eight fellow uh, teenagers and I beat the shit out of them and then I heard that we had the national champion in our own city in paddleball and I went to that tournament at the Kona Kai Club here in San Diego and met the eminent EF Dr. Bud Muehlheisen and I made it to the finals in that first tournament against the best paddleball players then playing in San Diego and I uh, lost to Muehlheisen in the finals but a, f a funny story occurred then I was I was practicing quite a bit. My way of approaching something is never go to an event that you're not prepared to go for. So I, I was hit, already hitting a thousand shots a day by myself in, in the closed court at San Carlos, which had a incandescent light hanging from the top. It was the only light in the court in, for the evening practices. And I hit a thousand shots a day and I'd already divided the court into nine quadrants and I hit from this many and I recorded all of my results and my percentages and but I was self-taught no one explained to me here's how you're supposed to produce from a biomechanical standpoint to hit with power and what have you so anyway I get in against Muehlheisen and I'll never forget this because one of his friends was the host pro Ben Press one of a very prominent tennis person in San Diego and I went up to him because Muehlheisen was on the spectator court and I was on the dungeon working my way up through the rat tail. <laughs> well, I get, I go up to uh, press before I'm playing Muehlheisen and I'm in 10th grade. <laughs> and I go, hey, uh, Mr. Press, I, I'm Charlie Brumfield. I'm coming up to the other draw and I understand you're Dr. Muehlheisen's friend, but can you give me a scouting report, please? <laughs> and press turned to me and he goes, he tires after seven hours. <laughs> and I got down there and I must have run a hundred miles uh, in that match and I look over in this white knight German with a half golf glove, white, immaculately attired in tennis gear, has a token patch of sweat <laughs> on his chest. So I was very uh, lucky. He came over to me after my showing. I got double figures in both games, and he said, would you like to start coming down and playing me at 6.30 in the morning, which unfortunately was right when I got back from Tijuana each night, but I said yes. And I would go and play him at a YMCA here in San Diego three times a week, and we played singles. And the torture that I endured in, during that first year was just incredible. And every time after the match was over, I'd say, show me a shot. And he would say, well, here's how I hit this. And, he, and I'd go back at the thousand shot a day routine and work on that shot until I was ready to ask for the next one. And about two years into our relationship, I could beat him in practice. But it was, it was a very, very good, it was very good and very bad. It was very good in the sense that I had a world-class player who wanted to win and was not there to play social giggle ball, playing with me three times a week. The bad news was that when you play someone is equal to you or better all the time, especially someone as sophisticated as he was, it shrinks your repertoire. I had all the same, the same kind of shots you see from Kane, the freak balls and the double, the double reverse pinches. I had all of that. And that's because that's what I'm doing, learning on my imagination in the court by myself. 
You try that against Mielheisen, and you go on a tour that you can't believe if it doesn't work. And gradually, because I didn't want to lose the Coke bet, I reduced my game down to what would win against him, and it never expanded again. If anything, I've contracted it even further during the next 40 years of experimentation. Really? Really. Wow. That, that's news to me. Um, getting, going back, the first mm. Nationals, the transition from paddle ball to racquetball, when, as I recall, that happened in 68 or 69? My first national tournament in paddle ball was my second tournament after playing Mielheisen. So you started I, right at the top. I went to Minneapolis, Minnesota in the December of 67. I had never been away from home. I was a little kid. And as luck would have it, I played the national champion in the first round. It was this 6-4 uh, squash and tennis superstar from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Paul Lawrence. He was, he was 23, and he had beaten Mielheisen the previous year. Uh, he beat me 21-3 to in the first game. And what I think is one of the most impressive things in my career, I beat him 21-3 in the second game and then beat him in the third. And you can't get any better than that for being a raw kid, very little tournament experience, just coming from adaptive gym, to face down somebody who's beaten you that bad and not go in the tank is something that I, I hold very, very high in my tournament career. Why did that happen, do you think? How did you adjust? I, my coach, really, Carl Loveday was watching the match. He had been very helpful in, in polishing what Mielheisen had created. He was a very smart person who had been the head of the Thomas Cup for the U.S. team in badminton and had played internationally. He was a superb athlete. Right. He came down to me and he said, Charlie, you're trying to be too precise on your serve return and you're catching the side wall and this guy will never miss. That's what he said. This guy will never miss and he did. So he said, move the ball out and go in and bum fight with him. He didn't use the term, the modern term <laughs> bum fight. Yeah. But he said, get in and use your abilities. Block, scrap, claw, kick until that guy goes down. Right. Until that guy goes down, you're in there in his face. And that's what happened. And that's, so. that's what happened. Throughout that tournament, I played national, former national champions in paddle ball, and every one of them was either injured or just decided, I do not want to deal with this kid any longer, <laughs> and left quietly, because yeah. it was a bitch. I was, whatever you saw when you watched me in my career, it was worse or better, however you want to characterize <laughs> it at that point. Uh, you're... I had this all planned out, the questions I was going to ask, but every time I, had, I asked one, you jump ahead and get me into another category. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you about Carl Loveday, and I wanted to share something with you. In 1970-something, I read an article by Carl Loveday that in the 1970s, I thought, well, that sounds ridiculous. Today, I reread the same article uh, and thought it made a lot of sense. And what he said was, most people are wasting their money going to racquetball coaches. You need to come and see me. <laughs> and, and so when I read that as a young man, I thought, well, that's kind of ridiculous. But now that I, and I don't mean, I don't mean literally come and see me. I mean, they're only, he, I think he made the statement, there are a handful of people that really know the game or something to that effect. And at that time, I found that, uh, that's ridiculous. But now, now that I've been around the horn a little bit, I understand a little more. So how, so he was the badminton uh, expert, and, but he was more than a badminton, or, or more than just a technician, it sounds like, right? He could get into your heart and soul? He knew how to deal with 
very difficult circumstances. He had a lot of wisdom. He was an orphan that had grown up at the YMCA in downtown San Diego. And through very tough times and went into the military in World War II, he was just a very interesting individual. And what he would do is, is he would take whatever meal, Mühlheisen was this Germanic, and there was one way and it was the highway, and that's the way you play or you're obviously falling short. Carl was it that way. Carl could hit every single shot from every angle and he gloried in being able to do that. He, he's more like Kane and Hogan, and Muehlheisen was more like Swain and Brumfield. And Carl would encourage me to keep using the old shots. He, he, would play, he and I played doubles together. He was in what I thought was ancient at 45, and I would play with him, and we could beat just about anybody in the country because he would create the shots and make them count. Now keep in mind that when all of us were coming in now, these people are coming in from different disciplines. And Muehlheisen was a superb tennis player. He was also a good badminton player. Carl was a great badminton player, world class. So when they started playing paddle ball and teaching me the shots, all of the things that made great players in those disciplines were part of what was being was coming down to me. Right. Now Muehlheisen was totally grounded in a flat forehand and backhand swing. It was before the topspin era and he would work on just that perfect strike and the timing of that strike and he'd work by himself and he couldn't do anything. He couldn't hit the ball the way you see the modern pros play, but you've seen him play. He would go in against a pro, and suddenly that guy wasn't a pro anymore. Right. It was really weird to watch that happen. And I enjoyed that period of time because people were bringing those different disciplines and they were going toe to toe with the now the new racquetball group coming up right. that were playing power ball, right. and it was fascinating. Right, uh, I remember playing the Long Island Open when it first started with 1,600 people, most of them from outdoor, one wall in the parks in New York City, the most bizarre forms and techniques and things you've ever seen. And it was an exciting time of racquetball. Well, you asked about the first nationals in, in racquetball. The first, na now there's now a political dispute as to what was the first nationals, as to whether it was the Milwaukee event in 68 or the event that right. I played in in 69 at the Jewish Community Center in St. Louis. All I can tell you is I was the reigning national champion in paddle ball at that time. I'd be beaten Mielheisen solidly earlier in the year and we showed up at this this national tournament and there was 128 or people in the draw if now, I remember correctly. This is in St. Louis. This is in St. Louis. I and Mielheisen were unseated and I ended up playing a gentleman that I think was the first well, how seed. How could you be unseated? Because we're just two people coming from San Diego. So who would be seated in the first national? I believe that that uh, Bill Schmicke was the first seed, because he had finished second to Bill Schultz in in uh, in the right. Madison YMCA right. tournament. So I ended up playing Schmicke in that first tournament, and uh, I remember I heard him on the payphone after the match explaining to his wife how he had been beaten by Chicken Man. I didn't <laughs> like that one bit. <laughs> But the good thing about that, that, that tournament, that first tournament that I attended in racquetball was one of the more interesting events in my life because a goodly portion of those hundred some odd people competing in the open division thought they were going to win. And there's a whole different dynamic for somebody who's not been beaten when they tee it up to play right. in a court. Right. And it's dramatic, right. which shows how much the mental attitude affects the deal. And you're right, they came in, some were playing barefoot, they would hit with the same side of the paddle. It, was, it looked like a bunch of novice D players today, 
but the ball went down in the corner and they scored a point. It's not like today where you go in the pro tour and they all know that this guy's beaten them 15 times in a row. There was none of that. It was a dogfight for everybody in every match. <laughs> uh, players today may not understand, or even the future, may not understand the heyday of racquetball. So I want to throw some things out about that first national. One, the rule book. Did you have a rule book? There was apparently a rule book. I was careful, <laughs> for obvious reasons, never to review the rule book. But the, the hinder calls were, the hinder calls in racquetball have migrated way away from the foundation. The foundation was a bum fight. The foundation right. was, you're in my space. The foundation was, you better be out of the way now, when the I swing. The was Wallace and Yellen, no relation to the great champion Mike Yellen, from New Britain, Connecticut, pioneered sweatpants so that when they got hit, they could run in front of shots. Those hackers actually <laughs> won the, the national title, but not in 69. No. It was in 1970. Yeah. The, uh, the first winners of the doubles nationals in that tournament was uh, Mike Zeitman and uh, a gentleman by the name of Hyman, both of them 19 and 20 year old boys. Wallace and Yellen were these old curmudgeons <laughs> that did not move out of the way. I actually played them in a tournament. Oh, did My you? With, and I. Really? Yeah. Well, they, they did not move, and they were tough, physical yeah. individuals. Both of them probably weighed 230, and they, were, <laughs> they did not move out of the way. It was incredible for them to win because the one guy was 50. One of the guys, I think it was Yellen, was 50 years yeah. old, and he won the Nationals. Okay, so back to the first Nationals. If you had to use an adjective, one word, to describe the first Nationals of racquetball, what would it be? It would be puzzling. <laughs> because I'm coming from having watched the White Knight sweep and swing and be meticulous, and there was a purpose for every move he made. And Carl Loveday, who had a thousand shots, to walking in and looking at these people that don't look like they can play but sure as hell could. Right. And I'm also, I was just, it would just amaze me how much harder people competed when they thought they could win. It's still to right. this day, I've never seen another circumstance like occurred at that tournament. Yeah. And you asked about equipment. The equipment was really unusual. I used a uh, sawed-off uh, Sportcraft tennis. Uh, it's all, it was a, they had just come out with them, I think, in the previous 10 years. And I'd never played. With the I never, aluminum head? Or? No, no, this was wood. These were wood clunkers. Yeah. I never, uh, I only played probably four times before the Nationals. And the, the, we just found out about the tournament. I don't even remember how we found out about it. And we go, well, we can go kick some ass here. And so we just got on a plane and took off. Now, Mulehuizen, as meticulous as he was, had already researched and found out that he could get what was known as the Dayton Steel racket, which was a steel uh, frame and the strings, the clunker was this thick, and right. if you got near the hitting area, it would go straight left if you caught the then edge the of the steel paddle. steel strings, right? No, he had steel strings. Oh. We had, he was the only one in the tournament with a techno racket. The rest of us were using the clunker. All the rest of the 100 competitors right. were using the clunker. And the sweet spot in that thing was not bigger than two or three right. inches wide, because if you got near the frame, it would go off right. sideways. So it was a challenge, and it was a little bit different than the feel of hitting the paddle. And I had to make some adjustments, and it was a different ball. It was an exciting time, because it was no one knew what was going to happen.